I asked Nico to come along today as a new medical director for the um, injecting room, supervised injecting room, and uh, he kindly um, accepted the invitation. And I know over the last few months that, in terms of the injecting room issue, uh, you know, there, there's been a lot of interest in it. Obviously, the forum has been part of the process for quite some time around getting the injecting room up and running, and it's been going for about a month now. Um, Obviously, the forum is, was very, um, you know, quite ecstatic about the um, room being established and the announcement last October. And uh, after a lot of campaigning, not only by the Arrow Dragon Health Forum, but a number of other groups and other, uh, a number of other uh, community-based groups, um, drug and alcohol agencies, um, the coroner, um, you know, I could probably name about eight or nine or more agencies and groups that have been involved. So. Um, and then Nico was um, nominated as the new medical director and an extensive background, um, a local person, you're at Turning Point uh, for a while and um, WHO also in Adelaide, uh, worked with Dragon Alcohol Services in South Australia and uh, recently appointed, as I said, as the medically, uh, as the director of the medically supervised injection room. So <coughs> I'd like to welcome you along today and uh, I was just thinking before, we should have you along every month to, <laughs> to speak. Uh, I think you've probably got five, ten times the number of people we normally have at these meetings. But um, I think it's really important that the people in the sector, uh, particularly the people, I guess, that uh, work in the direct delivery of services, can hear what's going on. And I chose the last three days, obviously, because it's only been going for about three days, but also I think it's good to get an indication of what, I guess, some of the challenges were and also some of the, um, yeah, some of the successes over the past month. So thank you very much for coming along. Today I'd like to also acknowledge several other North Richmond Community Health um, staff here, the, um, the CEO, Demos Resource at the back, and there's a number of other people that work in, in that um, injecting room and, and uh, we welcome them as well. So thanks, Nico, appreciate, um, we're gonna have to, take that petition down if we get any more people um, in here. So, but thanks for coming along and I appreciate yeah, spending the time here today. Thank you. <coughs> All right, thank you. Thank, thank you, Greg. Wow, it's fantastic to see so many people here today. I, and I think that uh, represents the interest in, the, in, in this service that, that, that is, as Greg said, only recently, recently operated. And I mean, that's also partly why I'm here. I mean, I, I've been overseas for uh, the best part of the last 10, 12 years. And, and so I wasn't here when the debate was taking place as to whether or not we needed this safe injecting room and to see, uh, you know, while so much of the, the campaigning was taking place, I mean, you probably know more than me the, the history of, of, the, of the drug use in the North Richmond area, the, the fact that there's kind of probably a fatal overdose every two or three weeks in the in this kind of local area here, and and the real the grassroots campaign that's taken place over over many years that's ultimately resulted in the in the facility being open. But for me, when I was in the process of coming back to Melbourne, you know, I, I thought this is just too important an opportunity uh, not to be involved in, and and. And so that's why that's why I took it up. So, um, but I think seeing so many of you here today kind of shows that there's, there really is a lot of uh, community interest in this in this in this project. So my plan was just to talk to you a little bit about our initial month of operations, and then we can have a chance to have a talk about any of the particular aspects of that that might be of interest to you. We uh, uh, we opened on the 30th of June after. Um, it was a commitment, I think, from the government that they would open in June, and they were certainly they were very keen for us to open in June. I think it's uh, although when I arrived six weeks earlier, they, we didn't have a facility, we didn't have uh, staff, we didn't have the, the the IT system. So there's a lot of work that had to take place for that to happen. I don't know if, how many of you have been to North Richmond Community Health. Who's who's so. The majority of you. So if you go, you know, if, if you, uh, you know, for those who haven't, it's a it's a community health centre. It's a kind of a green, kind of funky looking building, in midst of the of the you know the five high rise buildings of North Richmond, where kind of five thousand people live more or less, 
Um, you know, it is right next to a school, but you know, that's if, when you've got 5,000 people, it's also within kind of 500 metres of that 5,000 people, which there would typically be a school with such a, a dense population. Um, but it's kind of, it's got, the, it's, uh, it's kind of adjacent to a kind of some of the, 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 the open space between the buildings, uh, and it has a car park behind it, and, and it has a needle a syringe exchange on the edge of it, or kind of close to the car park and the, and the, the, the grassland, which has been the focus of, of uh, which has been one of the busiest needle syringe exchanges in, 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 uh, in Melbourne, and has up to 300 people a day. And over the last 10, 20 years, North Richmond has really, has, that's the main drug and alcohol link that they have is, with, is the provision of needles in this needle exchange. And, uh, and to, to the, from the very beginning, they, the staff there already have a fantastic relationship with these 300 people who come in. And when you're just delivering uh, needle exchange and offering people whatever services you can do in that context, there's a very, you have a, a capacity for a very particular dynamic uh, with, those, with the clients. You're not forcing them to be a certain way. There's no pressure that you might have in in, in some in drug treatment services or in other services that are very where they are kind of where, you, where they're kind of your one's behaviour has to be more constrained so to speak so you haven't got you're not you as a as a clinician as a healthcare worker you're not there imposing rules the whole time and that that has the advantage of allowing the North Richmond staff to have a really uh, what I, you know, in my experience, I've seen one of the closest relationships between the healthcare <coughs> workers and staff. So that, so that was the, the uh, uh, and the clients. And so that was the, that's the background to North Richmond. There's the uh, many people would collect collect their syringes and and go and inject in in the various. Uh, they would go home, or they would go and inject in the kind of laneways of Richmond. Or in the, in the car park behind North Richmond, which was in in a sense a kind of a, a de facto injecting space, and if at any particular time, if you wandered through that car park, you would see several people kind of hidden away between the cars injecting, um, and and that's been kind of going on for many years. So we now have an injecting. Room, a part of North Richmond Community Health was, which was a, a meeting room, has uh, has been converted into an, a facility. It's a, it's modelled on the Sydney facility. It it has a it has a kind of three spaces. It looks very clinical. It looks like a like a, a hospital in a sense on the inside. It has those kind of hospital grade liner. And so when a client who wants to use the facility comes, they they knock on the door and they they come inside, they have to uh, demonstrate that there's somebody who has a history of injecting drugs, that they have some drugs that they plan to inject, that they're, that they're 18 years old. Uh, and then we, we invite them to, to give us some information about themselves which could help us look after them about what healthcare needs they might might have, but it's basically an anonymous service, and there's very low barriers to entry. That people don't really have to give us any information beyond verifying that they're eligible to use the service. They don't have to give us their real name, but we do want to know what to call them by, and then we can recognise them when they come back. Um, however, when they so when they come back on subsequent occasions, again it takes about one minute for them to identify themselves to us and then they can come in and use the facility inside. So when they go inside, there are, there are 11, there are 11, capacity for 11 people to inject simultaneously. Um, three, three booths where up to two people can inject and five booths where one, one person can inject by themselves. People are given their sterile injecting equipment, but they, they bring their own uh, drugs, whatever they want to inject, they bring themselves. They're not allowed to share with anybody else beyond the, if they come in as a couple, they can inject as a couple. They typically will spend about 10, 15 minutes in that space. Um, they, if they're going to overdose, they will typically do it in the chair at the, at the table and that happens on average several times a day. Typically we, 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 uh, w you know, we will start with the minimal intervention necessary to keep that person healthy. 
if so that we'll check to see that somebody's if somebody's oxygen levels drop beyond what we're you know then they don't respond to being told to take a few breaths then we will give somebody oxygen if necessary we'll we'll breathe for them with a bag and a mask and if that's not sufficient and they're still not waking up or there's they're still no uh, you know they're not taking more than a couple of breaths a minute then we'll give them a small dose of naloxone and then every five minutes we'll give them a larger dose of naloxone until they wake up. So the management of overdose is actually fairly straightforward. We haven't had any problems in the management of the overdoses that we see there. Everybody's woken up and they've been fine. Nobody's been grumpy when they've been woken up, partly because we, we go slowly and we give them oxygen first. And you know, some, we had one person who woke up and he got such a shock that he'd overdosed and he immediately rushed around to see one of the doctors in the clinic to try and get on methadone. And you know, that's, so it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, you know, it's a less confronting space to have an overdose than, than on the street, I think that's for sure. Um, so, um, uh, so after somebody's revived or you know typically if somebody injects and it's almost entirely heroin that people are using 95 percent of our clients are bringing in heroin and injecting heroin we've had two percent of them in the initial data that i looked at that were injecting methamphetamine and three percent some other drugs so it's not that surprising it's basically a heroin market in richmond and 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 that's basically what we're seeing in, in the injecting room so typically people who inject heroin or sometimes other sedating drugs, you know, the peak, the peak sedat period of sedation is in that kind of first 10 minutes after they inject. And then it's clear whether or not they're going to overdose or not going to overdose. And if they're waking up to stand up, then they, they dispose of their injecting equipment and then they move through into our aftercare space where people can they can sit down and have a cup of tea or coffee and have a chat with some other of our workers in that space. They, 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 in, in a service like this, it's a, there's, a, there's a, a balance between kind of just kind of being, uh, letting people do their own thing and encouraging them to, to look after their health and to look after their, their health problems. And in, you know we don't we don't badger people into into kind of looking you know getting treatment for the things that they need. But but many of them have indicated they want to talk about hepatitis. They want to talk about drug treatment. You know they many of them have mental health problems. Uh, about a quarter of them have been hospitalised for mental health problems. So they're they're a group that have many complex health issues. And to the extent that they're interested in talking about it on that occasion, we invite them to to kind of reveal some of those to us in a way that we can then facilitate treatment for them. So that will take, then that take place in, in our, in our <coughs> space there. There's a consulting room off to the side and some services will come and, and, and uh, kind of have an, an, out, an in reach service in those rooms and we'll provide some of those services ourselves. So for many of our clients it's, it's not that they haven't had the desire to look after their hepatitis, they just haven't been able to navigate the healthcare system as we have it organised at the moment, which really, if, you, if you're somebody who finds it difficult to keep appointments, it, it's very difficult to navigate that system if you, if you're, if you, if you have a kind of, uh, a kind of more immediate focus on how you need to get through the day, it's, it's just very difficult to find the time to look after those issues. So we're going to try and build the healthcare response we have around the way our clients operate. So for hepatitis, for example, we will uh, we'll need, we'll, we need to, to diagnose the hepatitis, we need to take a blood, a blood test soon, we'll be able to do it just with a finger prick, but we'll need to take some blood. Sometimes that's a challenge for people, but we've got a retired anaesthetist who's going to help us take blood from some people who are, who are particularly challenging to take blood from. But then when we get the result, the next time we see them in a, a few days later, we'll immediately be able to give them that treatment. So then we won't require them to, to go and anywhere else other, you know, to make appointments or any other health service. We'll just be on, on two, you know, we'll, we'll have one occasion to take blood and have a conversation. And then the next time we, inter we'll, we, we see them, uh, you know, given the time it takes for the results to come back and to organize the medication, we'll give them their medication. So hopefully we'll be able to treat a lot of people's hepatitis in that model. I mean, 
Uh, I don't know. There, there's a big push in Australia at the moment to eradicate hepatitis C. It's a, you know, uh, but it re it relies on on us being able to find models that can treat, you know, a high percentage of our population. And this has been a group who who are really important in that, but have been difficult to access so far. So I think that it's you know, depending on how that goes, when we can look at implementing a similar approach in the in the needling series. Sorry, Jimmy, I've done it. So that's our model. People stay in that in that third zone from anything from a couple of minutes to half an hour and, and then and then they and then they if they normally you'd be surprised how unintoxicated they look. Most of them have got a very high tolerance for the medication, the drugs they're taking and they, they don't look intoxicated at all. Uh, if some are a little bit intoxicated, we encourage them to stay a little bit longer. And, and, and that's basically the, 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 what happens. It's uh, the rest of the business in North Richmond Community Health is just carrying on exactly as before. Uh, some of the staff in North Richmond, I, I think it's fair to say, were a little bit nervous about it, as uh, many people in the, in the, in the community. And uh, and it's been the you know uh, the conversations I've had with them they they've felt you know since we've opened they've realised that it's it's not such a big deal that you know that it's not going to affect the way that the other clients access the service and and they feel much more comfortable about it and I think that's been the same experience with the parents of the school some parents of the school were nervous about it opening next door but since it's opened they realised there are less people kind of intoxicated on the street on the way to and from the school. There are less syringes in the streets around the school. There are less people overdosing in the car park. You know, we haven't had the opportunity to see the, the ambulance figures yet, but certainly anecdotally there, there are less call outs. The, um, the fire brigade is certainly telling us that they've been called out less. And uh, even the police are saying that if anything, the impression is that, there, that there's, there's certainly no increase in activity around the centre, and if anything, the streets seem a bit quieter. So that's, that's our initial experience. Um, uh, and I, I, I thought maybe I'll just stop there and let yeah. people uh, ask any questions that they have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dickie. Thank you. Uh, Lady there. It's funny, you know, we, people, many people are very nervous about giving even a fake name and they say, I'm not doing that. Um, uh, and then when we stop and think about it, you know, many people, then they, they realise the process is not that threatening and they'll, they'll give us a name and then they'll sign their real name after. <laughs> 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 you know, because I don't think you said that, you know, in that space where they were afterwards, that they were afterwards, sometimes they do feel like they're just sort of so at that point, you know, we'll, we may need to ask some more information. So accessing Medicare, accessing the PBS requires kind of identifying information and it's difficult to maintain anonymity at that point. So, you know, again, it's up to people if they're happy to have the, you know, access to those services. But um, I think by that stage, we'll, we, you know, we've, got, we've built a relationship with our clients and they Generally, generally, it's the same like with the needle exchange. People are get, it's anonymous to use the needle exchange, but many clients of the needle exchange also have been clients of some of the doctors at North Richmond, and they realise that if they want to access the, the healthcare system more broadly, then they need to provide uh, some more identifying information. Thank you. Lady here? Yeah, um, that's not true. Like, um, the week before, there was a Certainly, people who are continuing to inject outside. And I think you were, you were at one of the ODs during the day. Yeah, so I think I think that weekend, maybe two weekends ago, yeah. the one you're talking about, and we did have like four or five brigade trucks and, and things like that. And that was somebody who, who didn't realise that the service was open on the and, weekend. And then uh, he was revived, and straight away he went to the, the needle machine, got machines and went home, got needles and went home. That could be the case. 
So there, there, there are certainly people who, who are continuing to inject outside the facility. And they, and, and they, mm. they always will get so out of it. We, 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 we just get to come out of our door because they're always congregating right outside our front mm. doors, yelling, screaming, abusing each other. We walk out, we look at them, what are you looking at? Mm. Now we live there. And <coughs> my next, um, one of our neighbours had a car stolen by a junkie. Mm. He drove it to Melton. The police rang her and said, we found your car in Melton. The junkie's still sleeping in the car. So, like, this kind of, there, there has been really a lot of, like there so has been a lot of drug use in the, in the Richmond area for a long period of time. And the kind of things that you've been describing have been happening in Richmond for a long period of time. Yeah, but they're congregating at North Richmond Community Centre before they ever did. Now they do yeah, no. in Victoria Street. And now Victoria Street, if you go down there on the weekend between 12 and 4, mm. there's all types of people around there. Yeah, that, that hasn't been my experience. I mean, I've been there for six weeks before the centre opened and the now the period after. And certainly I haven't seen any more congregation around the centre than there was before. And the, I mean, well, the, the and we, we, you know, we have, and while there, while there certainly are some people who continue to inject in the country, <coughs> there's certainly a lot less than before. And the, the Department of Housing are collecting those numbers, so we'll have the chance to look I at, mean, look at those young numbers. Young kids in the Can I move on to the other questions? Because a lot of people in the audience. Yeah. Uh, my name is ADL, I work in Area Mental Health and Homes Outreach. I think the service sounds brilliant so far. There's obviously some issues there. But I was um, interested in who actually runs it. You can't train nurses Sorry. there. We can't, we can't hear you. Can you stand up, please? And just speak slower. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is ADL, I work in Area Mental Health. I was wondering um, who actually runs the service. Is it trained nurses or just mm. AD workers in terms of like their life support skills and things like that? So the, the service has a, a mixture of nurses and, and AOD workers, or we call them harm reduction practitioners, yeah. and there's always a minimum number of nurse, nursing staff present. And the, in terms of the clinical responses, it's led by the nursing staff. So all the nursing staff are, are trained in emergency life support management, and but the, you know often the, the AOD workers are, are also they all trained they're also trained in basic life support management, and uh, so the the, the from a day-to-day -day management, the nurses are quite capable of responding to any overdose that's, that's, that may occur in the facility or any emergency situation. And beyond that, we're not running an emergency department. If anything happens beyond that, we, we, we will call an ambulance if we need to. That having said that, there's also the backup of a number of medical supervisors who are on call, who are the, the, some of the GPs who work in the facility, who can be there very quickly if they, but they're always on call. And and uh, and uh, you know I'm also around, uh, but you know the bas but basically the, the the clinical responses are nurse led. Great, thanks. Another question? Yep. Um, Ash from Psychedelia Radio. Um, I understand that this is phase one of like the three three phase progression of building the centre. I'm just wondering what that looks like for the next phases, and if there's going to be any interim reports so we can kind of follow the progress. So the, the, the centre is part of a two-year trial and, and the, the, there's an independent evaluation group which will determine whether or not the trial is meeting its objectives, you know, whether or not it's, it's able to attract a, the right kind of client group, whether or not there's a reduction in ambulance call-outs, whether there's a reduction in syringes in, in the area, whether there's an improvement in local amenity, whether there's an increase in referrals to, to healthcare services. In the, but it's also been identified that the, that the current facility is too small uh, to manage the, the size of the, the, the problem in, in North Richmond. We are already full on occasions. You know, we had 80 people on our first day and the number of, of clients has gone up since then and we are at risk of kind of not being able to fit people in. And so, the, so in, the, in the next couple of months, we'll start building a, a purpose-built facility uh, right next to North Richmond Community Health, which will have the capacity for, to, for 20 people to inject simultaneously and, and, and four consulting rooms for, for you know, uh, ancillary services to be provided. So that, that's going to, the work on that will start fairly soon, and that will be hopefully completed in the middle of next year. 
which will allow then one further year for the uh, evaluation to determine whether or not there's a further three-year extension. So that's, that's the current uh, plans from the Victorian Government as far as I'm aware. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm Julie from the Royal Women's Hospital. Just wondering, is the uh, facility open for pregnant women? And if so, have you seen any pregnant women? So the, the, the facility is currently not able to be uh, used by pregnant women. Um, but we, on occasions we've had to inform people of that, which is, it's, uh, and that's part of the political nature of the, of the facility, that it's, there's a lot of sensitivity around how it would be see, perceived by, by the general public. And I think uh, they, that's, that would be, it was considered that that would be too confronting for, for people to, to, to deal with. Although there are many good reasons why uh, this would be a, a, you know, an, an excellent facility for, for pregnant drug users to use, given the, the benefits of, of engaging in antenatal services compared to the, 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 you know, the harms of drug use, the, the, actually the benefits far outweigh uh, anything else. So but for the time being at least, um, uh, and this is also modelled on the Sydney experience, that that was also the rules in Sydney. Although I understand there's been discussions in Sydney as to whether or not that may change, and we have to see whether you know, that may not always be the case, but that's the current situation. Other questions? Um, Nico, you mentioned about most people using heroin. What other types of drugs have been used in so the facility? There are, there are, uh, there's a lot of unisom, if you look in the, yeah. uh, you know, the diphenhydramine. I mean, there's there's a, a sedating antihistamine that, that's purchasable over the counter, which is a gel, which, which people will inject. Some people will inject um, prescription opioids. That, that, uh, um, but the, the vast majority is heroin, yeah. And uh, there's a little bit of brown heroin, but you know, the majority is, is, is um, the kind of uh, the white heroin, so to speak. We, we see a, a small amount of methamphetamine, you know, 3%, so that's, you know, having said that, maybe kind of half a dozen people a day. Uh, and we, well, we haven't seen any, any issues, you know, we haven't seen any, any of the kind of problems with that that there's been some concern about in the media. Uh, our experience of, of methamphetamine use is that, that, that people may be a little bit chatty, and that's also the situation in, in, in Sydney, that you rarely see um, the kind of uh, aggression that you sometimes see in emergency departments associated with methamphetamine use. And I think that's a combination of the, the setting in which we're in, that people are less likely, it's less likely to result in, it's not a non-confrontational, non-threatening situation. And obviously uh, emergency departments are the focus of, of drug use that occurs in a wide catchment area which is then brought into those, those locations. Sorry, let us just follow up question from Greg here. Um, are we seeing fentanyl at all? So, we're seeing some people uh, injecting prescription fentanyl. Um, so, that there is a, there's a research project that, that is currently underway in, in Sydney and that we're looking at uh, doing as well, which will test for uh, synthetic fentanyls. So, no, you know, people. There's no, there's no awareness of a synthetic fentanyl market in Melbourne at the moment. So, if, if people aren't aware, there's um, there are, there are a recent worrying trend in the U.S. has been for, of the the use of synthetic fentanyls, which are extremely potent. So, very very small uh, uh, quantities of fentanyl can result in an overdose, which can be difficult to treat. And the recent increase in use in these synthetic fentanyls is has resulted in a, in a significant increase in overdoses in, in the US in the, last, in the last couple of years. And so there's, there's a kind of legitimate concern as to whether or not that's going to happen here. And so this program of, of detecting, of testing people who are happy to be tested for fentanyl will be a way of an early detection pl uh, plan for fentanyls in Australia. So my understanding is that Sydney to, to date hasn't detected fentanyl. I don't think at the moment we have this kind of synthetic fentanyl market in Australia. But that's not to say that it won't come. So the lady here, did you have another question? Or is it? You, you, you outlined a procedure for when people turn up. I mean, I don't know how rigid it is. But if people turn up and they don't have drugs, they don't have drugs on them, they just want 
reach out to somebody? What's the process? So they can do that. We have a room at, at the entrance that people can have a uh, chat, but they can't come in to the, use the injecting room. There's also, there's also a uh, drug and alcohol service where, uh, at North Richmond where people can come and have a chat. And, you know, um, and, and in the purpose-built facility, we'll have more capacity for, you know, we'll have a, a, a place associated with the injecting room there where people can just drop in and, and have a chat and then access the services there without injecting. But the, 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 the license conditions are very clear that you can't go into the injecting room unless you're somebody who injects drugs and has those drugs with them. Nick at the back. Yeah. Um, do you keep a, uh, a record of the sorts of substances that were brought in? And if so, how do you do that? Do you do, do the drug when they when the team wants to show you the drug? Is there any uh, testing of that substance so that you can check whether or not what they think it is is what it is, anything like that? So people declare what that what what that is, and we don't we don't test it. Um, we we um, so if people tell us it's heroin, we we record it as heroin, um, and they do have to, to show us that they have you know they have something that they you know that they're planning to inject it because we don't want people coming into the facility who are then going to try and uh, kind of hassle other people in the facility for the drugs that they have. Um, but there's no testing that to to verify that. Yeah. I'm sorry, you mentioned um, allowing couples to go in together. Um, are you allowing individuals at this stage to go in together? Because I know some of our clients have talked about wanting, they usually inject each other, mm -hmm. um, either issues with hands or finding veins, or it's more difficult to do it yourself um, at a certain point. Yeah. Um, and obviously, the, if they do inject themselves and they lose the drug, it sort of deters them from wanting to, to go back and do that again. Is there any sort of... So you don't, have to, you don't have to be a couple in the sense of a, like in a relationship. When I say a couple, you have to come in as, you know, you identify at the entrance that you want to come in together. But we don't allow people to inject each other for, you know, based on that. And that was the, again, that was legal advice in the setting up of the centre was that, the, that this could put uh, people at risk, uh, legal risk. And so, we, you know, that's currently the situation. There, there are some facilities in the world that allow that, but the majority don't. Uh, and but you're right, it's an issue for many people that they're normally are injected by somebody else, and that's the reason why some people uh, don't use the service. Uh, you know, you know, as, you, as you were saying, I mean, there are, you know, I mean, it's clear that there is a much larger number of people injecting in Richmond than are capable of fitting in our service. Um, and for some it's because they, they don't meet some of these criteria. Uh, and for some, it's it, you know it's it's you know it's a very different environment to inject in. You're in a you know there are people around. You're not on your own, and that's both reassuring for some people, and other people would prefer to to kind of be more more private. I mean, we have a feedback book, and, we, in, and many clients have left their feedback overwhelmingly positive that they feel. Uh, you know, it's it's very moving for them that they that they have a facility that's being built for them that they're able to, you know, that, to enable them to to do something which they see as being essential for them, but for which they they kind of often feel judged by the society. So, we, we we have a lot of very positive feedback from our clients on on, on their gratitude that the service exists, um, but at the same time there are there are some people who who, who don't feel at home in it. Do you do look at the location? Like, where they live? Yeah, we look at the postcode. So, the, the, uh, the, um, and, uh, you know, I would say about half come from the Richmond CBD area. So, Richmond's the main area, but it's probably only about a third of the people in total. And then, uh, and then the, the next main area is the kind of Melbourne CBD. Um, and, and then we look at the immediate surrounding suburbs and the northern railway line and then a smattering of, of, of random postcodes around Melbourne. That, t t that tends to be the geographic distribution of, of, of our clients. Can we know classes? Yeah. Somebody from Ireland? Jimmy, I think. Jimmy. Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy. Uh, a few questions. <coughs> what is the average time that per person spends inside there? That's the first question, please. So I think in the injecting room itself is about 10, 15 minutes. Sorry. 10 to 15 minutes in the injecting room and then the aftercare is very variable. But some people will stay longer. Okay. 
the second question is, is that the informant evaluation group, or can you tell me what the, of the composition of that group from what big areas are these groups from? So, the, so the, the independent evaluation group is led by Professor Margaret Hamilton and it also consists of uh, <laughs> Professor Ad Associate Professor Alex Cochran, who's a psychiatrist, who but also has a role in, le in managing health services. She was CEO of Western Health and also the Fire Brigade, I think. And then John Ryan from the Pennington, Pennington Institute. Uh, these are the three members of the independent evaluation group and they will work with the health department. They've already conducted a survey of local residents um, um, uh, to get their baseline the kind of experience of uh, living in Richmond. And then, and, uh, uh, but they, they haven't released anything on their methodology beyond that at this point. What about clients? Your customers or whatever. So I assume that they will engage them in, in that field. Yeah, I'm part of the group that evaluates it. And what about uh, the residents of the area uh, representative of the residents? So again, that's up to them. I have, we ha they haven't formally announced their plans at this stage. But, but we will certainly uh, be meeting with the clients and the residents, and we have been doing over the last few months. We've had, you know, we, we had a, a a, a feedback session with uh, with clients of the Needle Exchange to help plan for the service, and we'll be meeting with them on a regular basis to, as we look at the, the the development of the service and the implementation of the service. We've also been meeting with uh, some of the local community residents and, and some of the parents of the school and some of the, the other the businesses in the in the area. So I, I think you know as we see it this is a this is an opportunity for for to try something that, that wasn't there before and it, and it's an opportunity for a discussion of different sectors of the community to to, to understand the implications of this approach compared to what was happening previously. Yeah, well, I just want to say, I live across the road from there and we never did survey. I want to know why that area, Smith Street yeah. and Yorl Street, don't get surveyed. And that's really Everyone else seems to get surveys but us. We're actually on Lenny Street. We never hear. Yeah. 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 actually talk to Greg afterwards and pass on your names and if you talk to me afterwards, I'm um, sure. Because there's four levels of governance for this. You've mentioned, I think, one. There's, um, there's another one which is about local um, local representatives being part of the process. So we can talk afterwards, and I will um, pass your details on to the people at the um, Department of Health and Human Services who are, who are basically managing. Sure, uh, that, that's, the, what, that's 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 good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Lady back there. Um, how many clients do you think are repeat clients at this stage? Repeat clients. Um, most clients are repeat clients, so they, on, on average most people, uh, about 20% of our clients come back to, on the same day um, and most of our clients come back but they're not all of them every day, it's a, kind of, it's a little bit sp sporadic. We have some people who come every day, others who come from time to time. Sorry, Judge me like that. Yeah. Uh, mine's more of a statement of explaining what she just asked about the, the membership of the evaluation advisory committee. And um, you know, it's striking that there is no membership on there from the community who use the service. And there is no other sector in Australia where you would not have the community or the population involved involved in that level when it comes to drug use. Then, like, of course, there are political reasons for this, it's very sensitive. So just to add that, that that's a, a it's the premier has appointed that committee. It's I understand that. The point is to make constantly that nowhere else would this happen. Mm. It wouldn't happen in either health or welfare or social issues. But there is there is um, you, you are aware of course that there is um, uh, re peer representation in other um, groups or other levels within you know, the governance structure, because as I said, there's four, so there, there is representation from Home Reduction Victoria, but on another, on, on another component of the governance process. So it's not like that, 
It's just the evaluation, which is a small group, three or four people. But the other groups um, are quite big. Well, quite just, just to clarify, the, the evaluators are, are trained researchers, which is the yeah. purpose of yeah. the evaluation, not who they're actually drawing. Is that clear? Like, is that like correct? That's, that, that's so there, it's my not the about the actual evaluators wouldn't be, sorry wouldn't be the ones putting input into the process. They're just the people looking at the research, the data, quantifying that are doing the qualitative research or whatever they're doing. They're not actually contributing yeah. to that's the right. outcome. I think I think this level of this level of conversation, yeah. this level of conversation though, makes the point that at yeah. some stage the the you know the Yarra Alpha Forum should invite the that panel to do a representation yeah. Yeah. on this process because yeah. that's actually outside the scope of this conversation to a certain extent because they they haven't actually devised that but it is a it's a valid valid discussion isn't it and actually ways to get people to get different views into that process will be useful. Let me hear again. Yeah, I just had one more question. Obviously, the people that are going in are mainly opiate users. Is there any scope to um, give them um, information on naloxone and scripts to have their own naloxone for when they're not there? So that's certainly important. So some, some of them already have done that training, but the majority haven't. And so we have a, we have a, we have a process of training people and, and giving them the loan, giving them naloxone to take home. Uh, a lot, and the, a lot, the majority of them have witnessed an overdose already, so I think they're an, they're an excellent group to, to, to kind of carry naloxone with them, and we're certainly encouraging that, and we're, you know, and, uh, you know, we look, work, working to give them overdose training, and, and so that they make sure that they all have naloxone. So that's certainly our objective, yeah. Any uh, questions from this side? Sorry, let me hear, but well, this side's been quite quiet, so feel free to <laughs> jump in in the next 10 minutes. Um, Kate from Vic, how many uh, people are actually requesting testing and then treatment for the hospitalis? So it's, it's about a third to a half who have, re who have requested uh, that they have treatment, uh, testing and treatment for hepatitis. So, I mean, my thought is if we can make that seamless enough that we'll be able to to treat even, you know, that the others will also come on board and that we'll be able to test and treat everybody. Um, so, you know, we've had you know, more than 700 registrations so far, so that would be a significant, you know, uh, a contribution to our efforts to eradicate hepatitis if we can uh, show that this model works and then it'll be have implications, I think, for how we access um, clients, whether it's through needle syringe exchanges or potentially other facilities in the future. Do you, um, you said you prescribe and dispense in house. How are you coping with the volume of the scripts because it's a pricey endeavour? Uh, so the, the model that we have is a partnership with St Vincent's. Right. Where, so we would test people and uh, then we write, uh, we write a prescription that St Vincent's has the medication under Section 85 it is, which so that it's, it's uh, and so then they, but then there's no cost to the clients at all. There's no dispensing fee, so then they, they, they'll, they'll um, deliver it to us and then we'll supply, it's prescribed by St Vincent's and then we'll supply it. And, and there's, there's, so there's no cost to the clients or some fees in that process. I think, you know, if anything, they, they make some money out of it. Um, so the you know the Australian government's the one paying basically. They've invested, I think, appro approximately a billion dollars in, in hepatitis treatments, and but you know they're not going to get the full money worth on that unless they're able to we're able to find models of getting those treatments to the people who need them. Any other questions on that side? No. Lady, is that gentleman there? Yeah. No. Yeah. Right. So we, we do keep that data, so you know, we, it's like two to three a day where we have to intervene. But you know, they, they're not all potentially life-threatening. I think where we need to give naloxone, where, where uh, they're, they're, they are potentially life-threatening overdoses, but that doesn't mean that they would have died, certainly you know, in Victoria, most, Victoria Street, North Richmond area, most overdoses are witnessed and somebody calls an ambulance and the ambulance arrives and the person recovers. But having said that, there are you know, 
fatal overdoses every two to three weeks in the in the region. So you know, if we've been open a month, you know, you know, it's. Uh, it's Sorry, did you say two, three overdoses a day? The we witness, yes, yes. Sorry. Yes, we we see two to three overdoses a day. I didn't understand that. Sorry. Yes. On an average. On an average, yes, yeah. Um, but you know that. So you know that. But that's not two to three lives saved. If you think that there's only a fatal overdose in Richmond every two to three weeks, then you know, then then you know maybe if we if in the first month of opening we've prevented one of those, then I think that's a fantastic outcome. So that is follow up on that. So is there any anything you all do or say to these people who you know overdose that? But did you consider using a bit less? Yeah, so we, yeah, we, 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 we do talk to them, you know, and, and uh, uh, you know, that's about, you know, that's, you know, and in terms of the overdoses that require naloxone, that's kind of less than 1% of people who are using, so it's not, it's not everybody, but, um, uh, you know, I don't, it's, yeah, it is high, it's higher than we were expecting. Yes, yeah, so it's a lot of I'm going to let the lady that in the how pinky many, top top. That's okay. How many clients a day do you see roughly? So, you know, just, like just to say, we, you know, we, we released the data from our first week. We had 80 on the first day. And, it, and you know, just to say it's gone up substantially since then. So we're kind of reluctant to release a daily figure in case it kind of, because it does, it does fluctuate. But it, it's gone up substantially since then. There are times when we're completely full, um, you know, so, and, you know, we, we, but you know, we'll release uh, more kind of uh, we'll release more figures uh, in due course. Mm -hmm. With the other that have been taking place, is there any data collected on where the individual is purchasing it? Is it from them? Are they purchasing a new product from someone else, or is it they just using a little bit too much at the time of something that they have? So we're not collecting that data systematically. But a lot of people have told us that they've just got out of prison or that they haven't used in a while. The kind of typical situations in which you might expect somebody to overdose. You know, so. there you go. Just, I guess given the confronting nature of the overdoses and um, I guess the new facility, what support is given to the staff? And like, is there like, uh, are there higher levels of staff that, higher numbers of staff that might view or witness the overdoses more frequently, like times of day? Are they doing like a peer sort of supervision? Is it yeah, so basically we have a kind of peer supervision model. It's, I mean, it's, it's quite an intense uh, place to work in. It's, it's yeah. uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know the, the kind of the, on the one hand, you're kind of like washing, wiping tables at a kind of fast food outlet where people come and go quickly and you, there's a lot of cleaning involved and, yeah. um, and but you know there's you always got to be vigilant about what's happening in the room um, um, the management of the overdoses was you know you know it's become such a routine thing that it's actually pretty straightforward uh, you know which so, can be a problem in, in staff yeah um, in some ways well, but it, yeah. you know it's also good that the staff are experienced with that you know occasionally we have people who have kind of uh, sometimes find it difficult to get on with other people and sometimes our staff need to intervene like many of the other sectors in you know that in the you know that are probably represented here also and so we you know we have similar processes in place to try and help uh, the staff through that it, it's been it's been quite uh, uh, the opening of the service itself was a very was was a kind of uh, it was a very moving experience for many of the staff you know, I had some staff kind of say to me, in some ways it had been like, kind of felt like it was the highlight of their professional careers. There was, you know, there was a sense that, you know, something special was happening. The clients were, were very responsive to, you know, there was, there was certainly, it's been a, it's been a, a adventure for many of our staff. Some have had less experience with this client group, some have had more. So it's, it's certainly been a, an interesting process for many of them to come together and and kind of work out how they function together. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it's kind of not that dissimilar, I would say, to many of the other services that I've worked in with, you know, with a similar client group. I'm going to let Chris have the last question, and then we're going to draw it to a conclusion. Do you have any sense of who your typical client is, age, gender, length of using history? So 
they, uh, they are certainly more males than females. The average age is about 40, um, so which kind of represents, I think, the average age of overdosing in a way, and the, you know, the fact that our heroin cohort is a bit older than some of the other drug using cohorts. They, they often have a long injecting history. Uh, that many of them have been in jail. I'd say about half of them have been in jail. Many of them have been in hospital for mental health problems. Uh, you know, they, um, their significant proportion have housing challenges. I think the average, you know, most of them didn't finish high school. But having said that, there's really a, a range of people. You know, some, uh, you know, there are some who look well dressed and and you wouldn't suspect them if you're walking past the street that they they were injecting drug user and there are others who kind of perhaps fit the more typical stereotypes. So we have a, a kind of a, a full range of uh, young people and old people, kind of well educated people, less well educated people. <coughs> but that's that's the typical group. Okay. All right. I would like to um, thank Dr. Clock for his openness and um, honesty in his conversation. And I'd really encourage you all to give him a round of applause for coming up.